I'm afraid this is going to be horrendously trivial compared to the previous two. Um, I wish Lucy was still here, because I, I was a teacher in, in Wandsworth for about 15 years. And I once had a pupil who said to me when I met him in Tooting Market, um, if it wasn't for you, I'd be in prison. And the tragic thing is that a couple of years later, he was dead of a heroin overdose. But I, I ended up sort of helping to run a truancy center in Battersea. And if you think about it, a school for school refusers is about the most stupid thing that anyone could ever come up with. We lost, we lost our intake on the first day of every term. <laughs> and just recently, one of my truants got in touch with me on Facebook. And I, I, I met her in West London. And she said, she said why, do, why don't we have a reunion of all the truants? I said, come on, Amanda. They won't turn up, will they? <laughs> anyway. Um, a couple of weeks, well, a couple of weeks ago, somebody called Jonathan Taylor, who, who's a writer who lives in Leicester and works at the university, said he was compiling an anthology about drunkenness. And I, I was skeptical about this. I don't think it's going to sell. Um, but he persuaded me to, do, to write a piece. And I thought, as I wrote it a few days ago, I'd try it out on you. And in the time that's left, I may tell you a couple of jokes and then play the guitar. So you see what I mean about how trivial this is going to be. Um, so this is a story about drunkenness. And it's called Buying It Back. And it's true. Near the beginning of my writing career, when I found myself living in London and on the 1990s best of young British list, and everybody thought I was young and hot and up and coming, I suddenly began to be invited to literary parties. Well, Ned Bowman's on the present list. I'm just sure this has happened to him too. This is a cautionary tale, Ned. <laughs> there was still a budget for having fun in those days. And publishing hadn't been taken over by women in their 30s who were interested in being healthy and sensible and politically correct. Lady publishers back then liked their looseness and boozy nights and big lunches as much as their male counterparts. <clears throat> Just as much was achieved by these reprobates as is, as is achieved nowadays by their more sober successors. My publisher used to fly everybody over to Amsterdam annually this came to an end, allegedly, because of worries about the carbon footprint. But it was really because the Puritans always win in the end. If there had not been a good reason to end the frolics, the Puritans would have invented one. And if the Puritans didn't always win, we'd have no good old days to look back on, would we? Now that they really have gone, and our little age of Dionysus and his Bacantes is only a tender memory, writers who want to carouse have to invite their friends round and do it at home at their own expense. Now, Alexandra Pringle, a sparkly and beautiful woman now at Bloomsbury, was a great party goer. And I think it was to one of her parties that I went, somewhere in North London. It was not an area I knew well, as I had li only lived in very down at heel places such as Brixton and Archway and Rains Park. Uh, Bri Brixton was lovely to live in in there late 70s, reggae out of every window. Anyway, I had not bothered to eat anything, as I had, I had assumed there would be nibbles. There weren't, however. There was just a huge quantity of heavy-duty New World wine, the kind of Merlot and Shiraz that is 14% alcohol, rich and fruity beyond reason, and the only kind of wine that makes me feel seriously ill as I was shortly to discover. I tucked into the wine and felt perfectly all right. There was a young woman there who, I had been reliably informed, fancied me like crazy. She was pretty and personable, but I had never fancied her, and so I had kept my distance in order not to be hurtful. Even so, after a few glasses, I put my arm round her waist and became affectionate. She seemed to freeze a little, as if she knew I was only wearing wine goggles. And then, as I stood there with my arm around her waist and a glass of Australian hyperwine in my left hand, I suddenly knew 
with absolute certainty that I really had to leave. I put down my glass, ran downstairs, and grabbed my hat and coat. Outside, the freezing midnight air hit me with a delicious and welcome shock, and I began to walk briskly home. After a few miles, I realized that I had no idea where I was, <laughs> and that it was in any case probably impossible to walk from North London to Wandsworth in a reasonable amount of time. I sat on the low wall of a cemetery and began to feel confused and ill. Despite the freezing air, I broke out into a sweat. I had had two decades of being as poor as a church mouse. I had never hailed a London taxi before. I had never even stayed in a hotel. I remember Esther Freud telling me I was crazy to persist in using the underground when I wasn't poor anymore. On this night, I realized I would have to hail a taxi and damn the expense. When a taxi appeared, I got in and all seemed well. But then the driver began to talk and talk and talk and talk. If you have had too much Australian wine, the last thing you want is to have to concentrate on listening to somebody talk and talk and talk. The effort of concentration soon made me feel sick, and then more sick, until the waves of nausea became almost too much to resist. I think my voice must have become thicker and my misery transparent. Suddenly, the driver glanced in his rearview mirror and said, you're going to be sick, aren't you, mate? You're not going to be sick in my car. He stopped the taxi got out, went and opened the boot, came back with a large rubber bucket. He presented it to me, saying, you'll be sick in that. I vomited into the rubber bucket. <laughs> this is serious literature. <laughs> so try not to laugh, right? I vomited, I vomited into the rubber bucket just about as far as Foxhall. <laughs> and after that, I felt a great deal better, even though the driver was still talking at the same relentless pace. When we arrived at my address on Garrett Lane, I said, what should we do about the bucket? Whereupon he replied, either you go in and wash it out and I'll leave the meter running, or you buy the bucket. <laughs> I looked at it with the expert eye of someone who used to be a hard landscape gardener. It was a pucker bucket, good and solid, a high quality black bucket with a thick galvanized wire loop and a nicely turned wooden handle. It could easily cope with a full load of pug. Well, that's what we call mortar in Surrey. I could just see myself building a stone wall with a trowel and that superb bucket's loyal support. I said, how much is the bucket? And he said, two quid. I looked at it with a sense of wonder. A pucker bucket like that was surely worth an awful lot more. In fact, it was an irresistible bargain. I said, I'll buy the bucket. <laughs> Once indoors, I poured the regurgitated Merlot and Shiraz down the loo, and then abruptly had to sit on it myself. <laughs> Afterwards, I felt like the woman in that Playtex girdle advert back in the black and white days, who allegedly felt five pounds thinner for the wearing of it. The bucket did die in the end, but for many years it served me well. After I moved to Norfolk, I used to let it fill with rainwater, and my pet rook, Whoopput, would splash happily at it for hours. It was just exactly the right size for a rook bath, and Whoopput splashing in the bucket under the garage downpipe is one of my happiest memories. Her delight was touching and immense. 
Now that the parties are, o- are all over, and I'm cold and up and going, and not even on the best of old British list, I only drink subtle red wine, such as Beaujolais and Pinot Noir. I do sometimes wonder how many other people bought a bucket of their own vomit back in the 90s. <laughs> <clears throat> Well, I still hate Merlot and Shiraz, (laughs) viscerally, in the true sense of that word, with my very guts. Thank you. Um, I don't think I've got time for my jokes. I used to... I used to knock around a bit with Akabilt, the trad jazz pl- uh, clarinetist, and he, he knew the most wonderful, stupid jokes, but you'll have to get them another time, I think. Oh, you sure? You want to fit in the, fit in the song as well? Or you, what's he, okay, here, here, here's one of Akabilt's jokes. In fact, if you rang up Akabilt, he would hardly talk to you unless you told him a joke first. Two old people sitting on the beach at Western Super Mayor, and one of them says, Cool, I really fancy an ice cream. And the, other, the old lady says, oh, yes, ice cream, that would be nice, wouldn't it? And the old man says, yeah, uh, you know, with the chocolate bar in. And she says, oh, yes, with the chocolate bar. Why, why don't you go and buy one? So the old man says, right, uh, two, two ice creams with chocky bars. I'll see you in a minute. Well, two hours later, he comes back with a meat pie. <laughs> and she says... You stupid old fool, I knew you'd forget the chips. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) The others will have to wait. Um, Yeah, I was was a teenager at the time when uh, boys like me just wanted to play the guitar and be Bob Dylan or Paul Simon or Donovan. And we all learnt our three chords and so on. Um, in fact, playing the guitar and singing Donovan songs or Dylan songs was just about the only way you could get a girlfriend apart from having a car. And uh, um, like most other people, I think I fell in love with it for its own sake quite quickly. And I, I was a musician for, before I was a writer. And recently, I've sort of started doing writing new songs. Um, and I'd, I would like to play you one, which is, um, I think, the first time it's ever been done in public. And it's... Th- it's a gangster story from Mexico. And um, are there any of you who fancy yourselves as reasonably good on percussion? Anyone? Because... Go on. I guess use the backlighting so I can see. I haven't bothered to learn this song, so I need to read it. I think that's all right. Right. I guess I need this up here, aren't I? This was done by a superhero. That should do it. It's going to be one of these ones that sinks down very slowly. (laughs) That's why it was so tight. I'll just creep down. This is called The Romance of Margarita. Oscar and Romeo wipe the sweat from their brow by the fountain on the Avenida. Oscar says, Romeo, do you remember the time we shot that gringo down for messing around with Margarita? Now Margarita lives in a village in the south on the streets of the Puteria. 
the children and the hens are in and out of the door and she's waiting for Luisito Luisito El Ladronito The moon cast shadows on tequila bars in the streets of Matamoros Luisito tips a sunset down Oscar strikes a wax phosphoro for his cigarillo for his cigarillo now Luisito's driving the getaway car down in Santa Rosalia all I have to do is get in and out quick a plena carrera tendida at the casino the casino esplendido they drive all night and then abandon the car on the beach at Ensenada Oscar says Romeo let's get rid of this jerk and he empties his revolver into Luisito su fiel amigo ay 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 mi valiente corazón no father anymore for her children ay 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 no more sweetheart now for the dark eyed pesarosa margarita Now Margarita's weeping in her funeral clothes The house is in and out with neighbors A stranger comes in and he tips his hat Senora, I brought you flowers They're from Oscar and Romeo Ay, 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 mi valiente corazón No father any more for her children ay, 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 ay. no more sweetheart now for the dark eyed Pesarosa Margarita the stranger returns from time to time bringing flowers and empanada he never says a word about where he's from He's waiting for her to ask him He is waiting for Margarita Ay, 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 ay Paciente corazón Alma tan plena de confianza Ay, 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 ay he is reaching for the heart of the dark-eyed Mariposa Margarita. Ay, 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 paciente corazón, alma tan plena de confianza. Ay, 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 he is reaching for the heart of the dark-eyed Mariposa Margarita Thank you.